So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Nice to see you all. Welcome to session 11 of our course about the foremost theories of old. It seems that today we are a small group, but maybe more people will come. Uh, we will see. So today we are talking about Yashodara and Bata, um, Bata Kachana. And according to tradition, these uh, are probably the same person. These are two names for the same person. And we'll explore a little bit if that is the case or not. And um, of course, Yashodara is a very mysterious figure because she doesn't really appear in any of the early sources, even though she is the Buddha's wife. And so she should be quite famous, but uh, she is really, really difficult to find in early sources. In later sources, of course, she's very popular. So before we start, as usual, we will chant the Namutasa and feel free to join me if you like to chant along. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Bodang Dhammang Sangang Namasami So I will share my screen as usual and show you what we are doing today. So Today, um, uh, we will briefly have a look at the early text, what we can find there about, um, well, Batakachana uh, and about the Buddha's family, if we can find anything there about the Buddha's family. And then we will have a look at Yashodara's Pali Apadana text, which is a very beautiful Apadana, but of course, Apadanas are later um, literature. Um, but this is uh, one of the later texts that really celebrates uh, women's accomplishments. So contrary to many of the other later texts we've seen so far, where the situation is quite difficult for women, uh, in this Apadana we will see uh, a, a different point of view and I think a very beautiful story. And after that we will have a look at a Chinese text, uh, Bada Kachana story in the Chinese Ekotara Agama and compare a little bit how uh, the Chinese sources uh, portray Badakachana as opposed to uh, the Pali text. So that's the plan for today. And um, Yashoda does not appear in any of the lists of the foremost nuns because those lists, uh, of course, belong to the early um, strata of text. But we have Bada Kachana there, and then later tradition identifies Bada Kachana with uh, Yashodara. So in the Ankutra Nikaya, we have Bada Kachana as the nun who is foremost of the disciples who have attained great insight. So here she has a wisdom quality. In the Ekotara Agama, um, Bada Kachana is the foremost of those who have irreversibly attained liberation by faith. So here she has a faith quality, which is obviously very different from the Anguttara Nikaya. And then we have T126, which as we have seen many times in our course, is of course a somewhat later list. And here actually Yasodara's name appears. Here she is called Rahula Mata Yasodara, so Rahula's mother Yasodara. And here she is the great Bikuni disciple who did good deeds in previous lives and is endowed with great merit. So she has a merit quality, which again is very different from the other two sources. And this already shows us uh, how difficult it is to pin down Yashodara's character or to trace her in the early text. Because all the other nuns we have looked at so far, uh, when we compare the list, 
then their foremost qualities are actually quite stable across traditions. And so their basic character or their basic major trait, character trait that they are famous for uh, is consistent more or less across traditions. For example, when we looked at Mahapajapati, she was always, always the one who was ordained the longest with the most seniority. For um, Kema, it was wisdom. For Upalavana, it was psychic powers. Um, for Patachara, she had this Vinaya quality. Um, then Kisa Kotami, she had always had ascetic qualities. And um, Bata Kundala Kesa was always the one who attained Arahanship the swiftest, the quickest. But for uh, Bata Kachana slash Yashodara, um, there's really no consistency across traditions. And that already shows us that her tradition, like the, the idea of her character doesn't really go back to the earliest strata of text or there's like, there's no consistency there between schools. So there was a lot of variance in her character and her character really developed over a much longer period of time. And um, now I will show you what the Buddha himself says in the early sources about his family and about his going forth. So traditionally we think that, um, I mean, we all probably, we all know the story of, um, the Buddha's going forth, where obviously he was married to Yashodara, and Yashodara had just given birth to the baby boy, Rahula. And in the middle of the night, the Buddha snuck out and he rode away without saying goodbye to anyone. He rode away on his horse and he crossed the river and then became an ascetic. Um, but that's actually not how the Buddha himself describes uh, his going forth in uh, the early sources. So um, here, this is uh, the Majjhima Nikaya 26, the Arya Parigesana Sutta, the um, Sutta on the Noble Search, which is a Sutta where the Buddha tells his own biography, so his life story in his own words. And he tells uh, of his decision to go forth and then how he went forth. And uh, there he says, mendicants, before my awakening, when I was still unawakened, but intent on awakening, I too, being liable to be reborn, thought what is liable to be reborn, myself liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, and become corrupted, I sought what is also liable to these things. Then it occurred to me, why do I, being liable to be reborn, grow old, fall sick, sorrow, die, and become corrupted, seek things that have the same nature? Why don't I seek the unborn, unaging, unailing, undying, sorrowless, uncorrupted, supreme sanctuary, extinguishment? So Nibbana. So the Buddha is reflecting, he's still very attached to all these things of samsara, all this suffering. And now he, he is reflecting that he should actually seek for a solution to the problem and seek for Nibbana. And then he continues. Some time later, while still black haired, blessed with youth in the prime of life, Though my mother and father wished otherwise, weeping with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, dressed in ochre robes, and went forth from the lay life to homelessness. Once I had gone forth, I set out to discover what is skillful, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. So here the Buddha said, here it seems that the Buddha did not uh, sneak out in the middle of the night. It seems that he actually discussed with his parents uh, so he knows that they wished otherwise. So clearly they had a conversation and it seems that they were present when he shaved off his hair and beard and when he went forth because they were there weeping with tearful faces. Uh, so clearly um, the family was present. And also Buddha mentions his mother and father. He does not mention anything about a wife. He doesn't mention anything about a son. Uh, so whether or not they existed is unclear, but clearly, I mean, the Buddha himself doesn't say that they exist, doesn't say anywhere that he was married in the early sources. And also there's an, in an interesting little detail that he says mother and father. So according to tradition, we believe that his mother actually passed away seven days after his birth and that he was raised by his maternal aunt, Mahapajapati. Uh, but according to this Sutta, he doesn't say my uh, my stepmother and father wished otherwise. He just says that mother and father wished otherwise. 
So whatever that means is obviously open to interpretation. Um, but in the early sources, we don't find the elaborate family background stories that uh, we find in later tradition. So um, that much is found in the early sources. Of course, later literature was extremely fascinated with the Buddha's family and especially with his wife. And uh, in later times, a lot of stories proliferated about the Buddha's wife. Um, but originally, uh, they weren't very cohesive. So there were lots of stories. And the Buddha's wife had lots and lots of different names. And only gradually over time, sort of everything coalesced towards using the name Yashodara. But we have lots of stories where the, Buddha, the Buddha's wife has actually different names. And I have copied a small passage here from Bhante Sujato's book, White Bones, Red Rod, Black Snake. So this is a modern book. This is not any kind of historical text of Buddhism, but I thought it was just such a uh, beautiful and concise summary. So I just uh, wanted to include that in the course and read it out briefly. And this shows us the variants uh, of names uh, that refer to the Buddha's wife. And Bhante Sujato says here, but who is she really? Her name is as various as that of the goddess himself, herself. She is Yashodara or Yasovati or Badakachana or Badakacha or Subadaka or Bada, perhaps Bimbi Deva or Bimba Sundari or just plain Bimba or as Gopa or Gopika, unless it was Mirgaja or Mirgarajanya. So all these are names we find in tradition. Um, that refer to the Buddha's wife. So we see, uh, obviously, uh, yeah, it's not very likely that an actual historical wife of the Buddha would have that many names. Um, and then also her family uh, is uh, like a little bit a similar situation. Her father was Dandapani or Mahanama or Amitodana or Sukkodana or Supa Buddha or Kinkinishvara. And her mother was Pamita or Amita or perhaps Godi, and her brothers may have been Ananda or Devadatta. So, so Yashodara, um, as I said, is a very mysterious figure. And only later tradition became very fascinated with it. And then we had a lot of stories about her. And one of the stories we are now going to read together is her story in the Pali Appadana. And uh, her apadana is number 28. And her apadana is, compared to other apadanas, her apadana is very interesting. Uh, we have read quite a few apadanas or excerpts from apadanas in our course. And when we compare apadana literature with earlier literature, uh, it is sort of noteworthy that apadanas are a lot more um, colorful or a lot more magical. Uh, it all seems a little bit exaggerated. Uh, there are lots of uh, magical powers on this play, and some of the numbers seem quite exaggerated. For example, Mahapachapati, who has a following of 500 nuns. So 500 obviously seems like a very big number. And, but uh, still, um, all these apadanas we have read so far had some sort of grounding in reality. Like, um, for example, according to Buddhist thought, uh, if you develop your mind, it's not inconceivable that you can attain all these psychic powers and that this is actually possible. Like in the thought world of Buddhist, um, Buddhist development on the path, it's actually, um, you know, these are actually possible. It seems very colorful, it seems very magical, but it is somehow still grounded in reality. Yashodara's Apadana is different. Yashodara's Apadana is really exaggerated to a point where it is no longer even conceivable that this could be real. Like Yashodara, for example, says she has a following of like hundreds of thousands of people. Um, other nuns, other nuns, uh, hundreds of thousands of nuns. So that's not a realistic number. And then uh, some of the things that are told in her Apadana also um, seem very fantastical. So we see that Apadana is still much later than all the other Apadanas we've read so far. Um, 
And uh, her story completely dwarfs, for example, Mahapajapati's story, which is also supposed to be very magical and very inspiring. And Mahapajapati's following of 500 nuns uh, is supposed to be uh, supposed to show us that she's a great leader with a huge support base. Um, but that's totally dwarfed by Yashodara with her hundreds of thousands of followers. And so obviously Yashodara's story must have come into being still much later than other Apadana literature. Um, and so um, after Yashodara's Apadana number 28, there is number 29, which is a story about, uh, about 10,000 nuns uh, who are all following Yashodara. And then uh, Apadana 30 is again 18,000 nuns who are all followers of Yashodara. And their stories are equally um, magical and fantastical. So a lot of Apadana sort of um, developed around Yashodara, all seemingly around the same sort of later point in time. And uh, I think now we just start reading the Apadana and then you will see what I'm talking about. And Yashodara's Apadana is very, very long. So um, we're going to skip lots of passages because we just simply don't have the time to go through everything. Um, but I think you still get a very good um, very good um, yeah, impression of uh, what, the, what kind of genre this text is, uh, is and what kind of stories are being told here in this version. And um, the story begins. At one time, the leader of men, so the Buddha, was staying in a mountain cave in the city Rajagaha, which was lovely and prosperous. This is what was reasoned out then by the nun named Yasodara, who was dwelling in that city inside a lovely convent there. Nanda, Rahula, and Bhatta, likewise the two chief, the two chief followers, so this is Sariputta and Mahamogalana, so Dodana Maharaja, this is the Buddha's father, and Gotami Pajapati, so this is obviously Mahapajapati, the great Teras of great renown and the Teris with great powers, They've gone to peaceful nirvana, traceless like the flame of a lamp. So obviously this story is set towards the very, very end of the Buddha's life. We know that Sariputta and Mahamogalana passed away just before the Buddha passed. And we have seen in Mahapajapati's Apadana story that uh, she also decided to pass into Parinibbana just before the Buddha passed. And she passed with her large following of nuns with all the 500 nuns and together with Kema and Kema's following. And we see even Rahula seems to have passed away before the Buddha. So this must be like in the last few days of the Buddha's life, this uh, Apadana story here. So uh, Yashodara continues, um, while the world's Lord still is living, I travel that peaceful path too. And having reasoned all that out, she foresaw the end of her life. Foreseeing that life's aggregates would be destroyed that very day, she set out from her own ashram, carrying her robe and her ball. So we see her story sort of uh, mimics Mahapajapati's story, uh, where Mahapajapati also decides to pass away just before the Buddha. And we will see more parallels between her and Mahapajapati in a bit. Um, so, honored by 100,000 nuns, the nun named Yashodara, greatly powerful, greatly wise, then went up to the Sambuddha. So, here is one of the examples that I talked about. Uh, she has a following of 100,000 nuns. So, obviously, this is there to show how successful she was, what a great leader she is. And uh, so the story here is written by somebody who had great respect for Yashodara and who really wanted to portray her in a very beautiful light uh, as somebody with authority, a strong leader, um, a strong woman. And then she goes to the Buddha and then the story continues. Having worshipped the Sambuddha at the wheel marked soles of his feet, sitting off, to one, sitting off to one side of him, she spoke these words to the teacher. I'm 78 years old now. The last of old age has arrived. I'm reporting to the great sage. I've attained sainthood in a cave. So she's an arahant. Old age has ripened for me now. Verily, my, my life's a trifle. Giving all you up, I will go 
my refuge is made in myself. So, um, again, I think this is a, a very beautiful line here that I have highlighted, my refuge is made in myself. So, uh, again, she's shown as a very strong, independent woman. She doesn't have the usual um, attributes that are often associated with women. She's very attached to her family or anything. But she says, uh, I've, I've given all you, all you up. I'm independent. I, uh, I've attained awakening. I've let go of all the fetters and I've made my refuge in myself. So um, uh, I think very beautiful passage here, again, showing her as a very strong, independent person. And she says, in the final days of old age, death breaks the body into bits. Today at nighttime, great hero, I shall achieve my nirvana. Where there's no birth, no growing old, nor sickness and death, great sage. I'm going to the great city, which unconditioned has no death. Through this vast multitude here, all these revering the teacher, know that every imperfection is forgiven face to face sage. So here she literally goes up to the Buddha and sa she says to the Buddha, I forgive all your imperfections, Buddha. So this is a complete twist of how we would usually think the situation should be where we are the imperfect ones and we have to ask the Buddha for forgiveness. But she here is basically shown as his equal, as a real companion to him. And she is the one who is forgiving his imperfections first. And then in the next stanza, she's now, now she's also asking for forgiveness from him. But first of all, she tells him, I forgive all your flaws, Buddha. So that's a uh, quite an unusual way of telling the story. And I think this is really to show that she is the Buddha's true companion, uh, basically on an equal level almost. And she says, transmigrating in existence, if I have ever disturbed you, I'm announcing it, great hero, please forgive my imperfection. So she's also asking for forgiveness. And obviously this is the ceremony that is still very much practiced in Buddhist circles up until nowadays. So um, something that seems to go back for a very long time, this uh, asking for forgiveness before we part ways, so that if anything has come up and something, you know, Anger might arise in somebody and we don't even know it that we have provoked them. So to make sure that when we part ways, uh, we are parting in a good way uh, without any um, tension between us, this forgiveness ceremony is something that is still very much practiced in monastic circles. And then the Buddha says, after hearing that speech of hers, the Lord of Sages then said this, what better can I say to you when you're going to Nirvana? Now display your superpowers Doer of my dispensation, let doubt in the dispensation be cut off for all assemblies. So the Buddha is asking her now to perform some miracles, some superpowers. Uh, and here he is giving the reason that he wants her to remove the doubt uh, from the people, doubt in the teaching uh, from people. And this again mirrors very closely Mahapachapati's story, where she also displays all the superpowers uh, before passing into Nibbana. And here the, um, the reason is given to remove doubt in the dispensation. But in many of the other stories where the Buddha asks the women to perform superpowers, um, one other reason why he asks them to do this is to remove doubt from people about the abilities of women specifically. So to show that women are entirely as capable as men to attain all the higher stages of the path, and to attain all the superpowers and so on, the Buddha specifically asks women to show that to people, to remove this misperception uh, in the abilities of women. So it's not mentioned directly here in this story, but it's mentioned in many other stories. So I guess specifically seeing a woman display all these abilities uh, gives other women a boost in confidence, other people and especially other women a boost in confidence in their abilities. And then having heard the words of the sage, the Buddhist nun Yashodara, worshiping the king of sages, then spoke this speech to the Buddha. I am Yashodara Hiro, in the home I was your chief queen, born in the clan of the Sakyas, established among women. In your household, O hero, 
I was the leader, the Lord of all, of the women there who numbered 100,096. So here in this story, Yashodara isn't just the Buddha's only wife. She's the chief queen, but the Buddha had many wives. Apparently he had more than 100,000 wives. Um, so obviously this is again an exaggeration. Um, ancient India wasn't that densely populated and it's not uh, realistic to think that any city, even the big cities could have supported that many um, nuns or that many women. Um, and especially all those women then went forth with Yasodara. So that would have to be supported as nuns by, um, by a community, which is um, not uh, physically possible. But of course, this again shows her, is, is th these numbers are there again to show her leadership skills um, and her authority and um, yeah, shown as, as a person who is somewhat equal in some respects to the Buddha, who is also a very great leader. And then here now there are many descriptions of the beauty of uh, and the, um, the good qualities of those women. So we're, we're skipping that a little bit um, because of time constraints. And then she starts to display all, all kinds of superpowers. We're also um, skipping the superpowers. And she is doing various transformations and all sorts of uh, other miracles. Uh, and, but there are two transformations that I found especially remarkable, and that is she transforms herself into Sakra. Sakra is Sanskrit in Pali called Saka, the king of gods, and also Brahma, the king of the gods in the fine material realm. And this, of course, is especially noteworthy. I think this is a direct reference to a passage that appears quite frequently in the suttas, uh, which has been shown to be a later insertion uh, by lots of research, by lots of scholars. So I think this is not a debated point. Uh, and there is a pa and that passage in the suttas, which the later passage uh, says that women are incapable of doing five things. They cannot become Saka, God, the king of gods. They cannot become Mara. They cannot become Brahma. And they cannot become a wheel turning monarch and they cannot become a Buddha. So I think here, this is a direct reference to that later insertion. Maybe at this point, the, that later insertion was already being debated. Uh, it's likely that people at all times um, must have questioned the le legitimacy, legitimacy of that passage. Uh, and here, um, Yashodara is shown as a woman to assume the form of Saka and also the form of Brahma. And we have another uh, Apadana type story or commentarial type story of Upalavana, who also had great psychic powers, where she transforms herself into a wheel turning monarch. So this became then a popular motif in women's uh, stories, where women do actually transform themselves into these, um, these beings uh, in direct opposition to that passage in the suttas. And uh, by doing this, obviously, they, they claim that this passage um, is wrong and sort of claim, reclaim the abilities of women to become those five things, including becoming a Buddha, a female Buddha. And then she um, continues uh, talking about her attainments. And um, these are kind of stock passages. They also recur in other Apadana literature. And then she continues talking. Yes. My meeting with all the Buddhas, in the, the world lords was well seen by you. My extensive service to them was for the sake of you, great sage. O oh, sage, recall the good karma, which formerly was done by me. That merit was heaped up uh, by me for the sake of you, great hero. So here now, um, she's referring to her meeting a lot of Buddhas. So um, later in her Apadana, we will see that she claims that she met millions and millions of Buddhas. Um, that also, uh, I'll talk more about this when we come to it, but that also seems uh, like a very much later tradition. 
according to the standard uh, Theravada um, way of thinking, um, Yashodara and the Buddha came together as a couple. Their, their sort of fate was interlinked. And uh, the Buddha Dipankara. And Dipankara Buddha is um, the Buddha, 24 Buddhas before Gautama Buddha. Uh, <clears throat> and that was um, so and so many eons and so, many, so and so many incalculable eons, a, long, a very long time ago. So that the 24th Buddha before Gautama Buddha. And he made the prediction of the future Buddhahood of Gautama Buddha. And uh, for Yashodara, he made a prediction for her to being the future wife of the Buddha. And then after that, they had many, many rebirths together to accumulate the good karma, to actually become uh, uh, Buddha and Buddha's wife. Um, so, but technically, because there were only 24 Buddhas in between, she can only have met 24 Buddhas in that time frame, according to traditional Theravada thinking. Um, so this might be a reference to those uh, 24. Uh, and um, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes when we come to the other stanza. But here, what is remarkable here is that she, um, she is calling the Buddha to witness all the good karma that she has made. So she is the active one here, the one making the karma, and the Buddha is simply witnessing that. Uh, and this is remarkable. Uh, I hope you can remember this for next time when we talk about um, Bata Kapilani, who is Mahakatsapa's wife. And um, so this is very interesting to compare Buddha and Buddha's wife and Mahakatsapa and Mahakatsapa's wife. Uh, and especially because Mahakatsapa kind of takes on a role as sort of an informal successor of the Buddha. So as he sort of informally takes on leadership in the Sangha after the Buddha's passing, he's the one who convenes the first council. He's the one who presides over the first council. So one would think that his wife, uh, Bata Kapilani, would develop in, uh, the stories around her would develop in a somewhat similar way to Yashodara. But when we, do, when we look at her next week, we see that it's actually quite significantly different. Uh, so the, the remarkable thing about this passage will actually become clear next week when we read uh, about Bata Kapilani. But here it's just remarkable that she is the active one, the one making the marriage, and the Buddha is the one who is witnessing that. Um, and then she talks about all the, the good things that she has done uh, and how, how, how like consistently she practiced that for, for billions, tens of billions of times. So again, we see these really, really large numbers. Um, and made an amazing, extreme amount of good karma. And then we're going to skip all this, all the things that she actually gave up. Uh, and she performed a lot of service and so, why, and, and, and so, so on. And uh, here then she, men she mentions how she and the Buddha uh, met under the Pankara Buddha, uh, how their story got intertwined, how their fate got intertwined there. I've left all this out. This is very, very long. Um, so I have uh, skipped all that. And after they met in the, the Pankara Buddha's time, then they were reborn together for a last, for a long time. And at last, uh, she's telling about her last life here. And she says, undergoing pleasure and pain among gods and human beings. When my last rebirth was attained, I was born in the Sakyan clan. Beautiful and very wealthy, famous and likewise virtuous, endowed with every attainment, I'm much honored among the clans. Uh, riches, fame, hospitality, and indulgence in worldly things, they do not agitate my mind. I have no fear from anything. And um, I was appointed to attend on what, the Buddha, what, on what the Blessed One had said with the harem of the king in the Kshatriyan city then. I'm a woman who is a servant and one who feels pleasure and pain, a woman who declares the facts, a woman who is compassionate. So again, she's celebrating uh, her own uh, um, attainments. And now she states, Buddha's numbering 5 billion and another 9 billion more. I provided vast alms to them, those Buddhas, gods over the gods. So these are obviously um, extreme numbers. 
sort of rare to find in Theravada tradition. This is more something that we find in Mahayana. But as we know, this Apadana is very late. So this might be a Mahayana influence here. Uh, where of course it's very common to have all these crowds of Buddhas flock together from different um, universes and all converge. Um, so here again she's celebrating all the merit that she's making but her story becomes more and more fantastical. This is something we haven't seen in any of the other Apadanas so far. Um, and now there are many many stances where she just celebrates um, all the massive amounts of Buddhas that she has served. So they are over and over and over more and more Buddhas that she's serving. Um, so yeah, we'll skip all that because I'm a little bit conscious of time. And um, then finally she says, disgusted with transmigration, I went forth into homelessness, surrounded by thousands of nuns after renouncing with nothing. So here again, uh, we see her own spiritual attainments. Uh, she had a very, very genuine spiritual vocation of her own. She didn't go forth because the Buddha made her to, like in the story with the Buddha's brother, where the Buddha sort of forced the brother to go forth, even though the brother wanted to get married. Um, and she didn't go forth because she was bored alone, like the story of the Buddha's sister. Um, who missed all her family, who had all gone forth, so she went forth to be with the family. But Yashoda actually is shown to have a very genuine spiritual vocation. She is disgusted with transmigration and de therefore she goes forth. She doesn't go forth because she misses her husband. Um, so again, we see a very strong, independent woman, a worthy companion of the Buddha. And um, now there are a few stock passages and um, then this is the end of the Apadana. So in this Apadana, I think what we can see is uh, that this story was written really to celebrate women's accomplishments and to really make it clear uh, what women's abilities are and that they're in no way inferior to the male abilities. And uh, so this story is here to celebrate uh, women in the Sangha, to celebrate bhikkhunis. Um, and uh, I just like find this so remarkable because in this course, uh, in the last few sessions, we have seen quite a few texts that really seem to put women down, that really seem to be very misogynistic, very sexist, uh, uh, and very so, sort of discouraging for women. Um, but the Buddhist tradition is not one monolithic block. Uh, first of all, the position of women sort of changed over the centuries. And we see that reflecting in, reflected in the texts that um, were created at different points in time. But also within the Sangha at any given moment in time, uh, there wasn't, and even now there isn't, um, unanimous opinions about everything. So certainly at all times, there must have been people, monks and nuns, who were very supportive of female practice. And there must have been people who were sort of quite opposed and um, uh, quite misogynistic. And all these uh, tendencies uh, is what we see reflected in the text. And that's sometimes that can seem very confusing because there isn't one clear line that always says women are such or women are such. Um, but there are all these multiple voices that we find in the text. And we do have also these very beautiful texts, very encouraging texts for women. And um, now, as promised, we will move on to the Chinese Ekotada Agama text uh, about Badakachana. And this text is, was translated by Bhikkhu Analeo in an essay called Karma and Female Rebirth. And this is published and is freely available on the internet, easy to find if you want to Google it. And I'm now switching to the other document. And um, this uh, Chinese sutta here, or this passage from a Chinese sutta is part of a larger sutta. And Bantanalio did not translate the entire sutta because it's very long. 
And anyway, we are just interested in the part about Vata Kachana. So it's perfect for us that he didn't translate everything. And he left a brief introduction here. So a summary of the beginning of the discourse, which is not translated. And uh, he writes, the tale of Badakachana is part of a longer discourse. This discourse begins with King Pasenadi visiting the Buddha. After being taught the Dharma, Pasenadi invites the Buddha and the monastic community to rely on his support alone for a three month period, which the Buddha accepts. Pasenadi has a great hall erected where for three months, he makes offerings of robes, food, bedding, and medicine. At the completion of this period, Pasenadi proclaims his satisfaction with the merit he has achieved in this way. In reply, the Buddha cautions him not to remain satisfied with the merit he has acquired and relates a story from one of his past lives by way of illustration. The narration of this Jataka, so Jataka means a past life story, concludes with the Buddha encouraging Pasenadi not to rest satisfied with the merits he has acquired, but to make use of them for the purpose of progress towards liberation. Pasenadi then apologizes for his earlier statement, which the Buddha readily accepts. So Pasenadi, King Pasenadi makes a lot of merit in this story, and then he rejoices, and the Buddha tells him, um, basically, that there are two ways of using this merit. One is to just uh, directed towards a positive um, rebirth, a nice rebirth, which is a way of squandering those merits because after that rebirth is over, you have nothing left. But if you direct it towards uh, progress on the path and you actually attain something on the path, then this is something you will not lose. So this is a good way of making use of those merits. And now at this point, the Bhikkhuni Badakachana gets up from her seat pays respect to the Buddha and repeats the injunction given by the Buddha to the king that he should seek to progress towards liberation, which she follows by relating her own past as an additional illustration. So here something remarkable happens. Two of the most powerful men at that time are sitting there having a conversation among, the, among themselves and suddenly being uninvited, or not, not being invited, I mean, the Spikuni gets up and barges in the middle of the conversation and starts uh, in front of the Buddha, starts uh, teaching her own, giving her own teaching. Um, and nobody finds it in any way uh, unusual or nobody thinks, oh, this woman is really out of line. Um, everybody in this sutta, everybody thinks, oh, this is a completely normal way of acting. So this is really, again, very, very empowering. Uh, to the women, to Vadakachana. Um, and then now here uh, starts the translation of the Sutta. And Vadakachana says, I recollect that 31 eons ago, Tathagata Sikkin, an Arahant fully awakened, had appeared in the world. He was accomplished in knowledge and conduct, a well gone one, a knower of the world, an unsurpassable person a charioteer of the path of Dharma, a teacher of devas and humans, called a Buddha, a blessed one. So those of us familiar with the Pali tradition will recognize this epithet. It's very similar to the Itipiso in Pali. So this is obviously a parallel um, passage to the Pali Itipiso chanting. And this Buddha Sikkin was wandering in the Malichi re region. At that time, when the time had come to beg for alms food, that Buddha put on his robes, took his bowl, and entered the town of Marichi. At this time, there was a messenger in the town called Sudakalaka. That messenger then saw that the Tathagata was carrying his bowl and had entered the town to beg for alms food. Having seen him, he thought, the Tathagata has now entered the town. He must need food. He promptly entered his house and came out with food to give to the Tathagata, generating this aspiration. Endowed with this merit, may I not fall into the three evil destinies. May I in a future life meet a venerable noble one like him. May that venerable noble one teach me the Dharma and may I then attain liberation. So it's, act, it, it's uh, somewhat parallel to what Pasenadi has done, uh, offering uh, things to a Buddha. 
Um, and that's what Badakachana is getting at here. And then she continues, Blessed One and King Pasenadi, may you both know this. Was the messenger Sutta Kalaka at that time someone else? It should not be seen in this way. The reason is that the messenger Sutta Kalaka at that time was me. At that time, I fed the Tathagata stick in and I made this aspiration. May I in a future life meet a venerable noble one like this, like this, who will teach me the Dharma and may I then attain liberation. For 31 eons, I did not fall into the three evil destinies. I was born among devas and human beings until at last I have now received this particular body. I met the Blessed One and gained the going forth to train in the path. I have eradicated all the influxes and accomplished arahanship. So now there are two very remarkable points in this story so far. And one is that um, Badakachana here in this past life was a male uh, person, a male messenger, and she gave food to this Buddha and then made, uh, made this aspiration um, may the merit that I gain from this uh, be directed towards my future meeting of a Buddha and my future path towards Arahanship. And that actually comes to fruition, the merit uh, bears fruit, and she does come into contact with a Buddha and attain Arahanship, but her body transforms into a female body. She, in this life, obviously, she is a bhikkhuni. Um, and that is celebrated as something extremely meritorious. The whole story is just to, to show how meritorious it is, how much of a blessing it is to, um, to direct your, um, your merits in this way. And in no way is there even a hint uh, or even a trace of the idea that it is unfortunate to have a female body. On the contrary, this is the fruition of her mer meritorious um, action. So I think that is quite remarkable. And the other thing also is that, um, as we have seen in the Pali version, the Buddha and his wife's story became interlinked, their, their karma became interlinked, their fate became interlinked in um, the Pankara Buddha's time. Um, and after that, they had many rebirths together. And obviously, um, Buddha had a male rebirth and uh, Yashodara had a female rebirth. Um, but here in this case, Bhattakachana has a male rebirth in the time of Sikhi Buddha. So Sikhi Buddha is well in between the Pankara Buddha and Gautama Buddha. That's not outside that time span. That's really uh, actually not that, far, not that far back from Gautama Buddha. So at that point, if Yashodara was the Buddha's wife, then she should have had a female rebirth, not a male rebirth. So here in this story, in the Kotara Agama, we don't actually get the impression that Badakachana is um, conceptualized as the Buddha's wife. She's just any bhikkhuni. So whether or not Badakachana and Yashoda should actually be identified as the same person is a little bit up to debate. If Badakachana and Yashoda are not the same person, however, then Yashodara does not appear in any of the early sources because only Badakachana is in the list of foremost nuns. Um, so then really there is no trace of Yashodara in any of the early sources. And anyway, the story continues. As the Blessed One said so superbly and sublimely in speaking to King Pasenadi, let all the various activities performed by body, speech and mind be completely for seeking liberation. Do not consume these meritorious, meritorious deeds on life in Sangsara. If I see Bhikkhus, Bhikkhunis, male lay followers and female lay followers with their hearts delighting in the Tathagata, the thought arises in me. Do not all these distinguished beings still need to have a mind of loving, kind, loving regard and reverence towards the Tathagata? If I see the four assemblies, I approach them and say, virtuous ones, what things do you require? Ropes and bowls, sitting cloth, needle cases, bathing vessels, any other sundry requisites of recluses. I will supply them all. Being permitted to do so, I seek for them by begging anywhere. If I get them, that is a great fortune. If I do not get them, then I will go to Uttarakuru, Aparagoyana, 
and Pupa Videha's seeking an offering. The reason is that through all this, the four assemblies will gain the path to Nirvana. So here again, Bhattakachana is displayed as a, a leadership figure in the Sangha. She's taking care of the others. She's providing all the things that they need. So she must feel a sense of responsibility towards the others. And it's again shown as a very capable uh, woman, as a ca very capable bhikkhuni here. Um, at that time, the blessed one examining the mind of the bhikkhuni Badakachana said to the bhikkhus, have you seen such liberation of the mind by faith? As in the bhikkhuni Badakachana, the bhikkhus replied, we have not seen it, blessed one. The blessed one said, among my disciples, the bhikkhuni Badakachana is the bhikkhuni who is foremost in having attained liberation by faith. At that time, the bhikkhuni Badakachana, King Pasenadi, and the four assemblies, having heard what the Buddha said, were delighted and received it respectfully. So this is the end of this Chinese sutta in the Ekotara Agama. Um, and I think I should slowly, uh, or maybe quickly, come to the end of today's session. So just to uh, conclude, uh, what we have seen today is the uh, uh, a Buddhist tradition really celebrating women's accomplishments, uh, a tradition that is very, very supportive of female practice that depicts strong, independent female leaders, very accomplished women. And again, this shows us that uh, Buddhist tradition is not one monolithic block and that there is a multi-vocality of voices and that um, and that at all times, just as now, uh, there were strong supporters of bhikkhunis among uh, the, op the obvious opposition that was also there. But in texts like these ones, we really see how they celebrate women and women's accomplishments. So um, with this, I'm going to end for today. And now, uh, if you have any questions or comments, I will try my best to see if I can answer them. So are there any questions or comments? Yes, Anna-Marie? Um, thank you. Um, so with regards to the um, um, changing attitudes towards women moving with the times, um, are, is it possible to say certain times, like 500 BC, so so and so, that that were more in favor, like in general, in, in the wider culture, that were more in favor, that we can also see in the text, like, is it possible to see these texts are from that period and they all seem to be more in favor or more positive towards women? So, um, it's not that easy to date the text. Um, Obviously, in the, the very early tradition, the tradition of the Buddha's own time, seems to be much in favor, uh, and that we can date basically to the Buddha's time. But still, there is a debate when the Buddha actually lived. So, but during the Buddha's own time, it seems the situation wasn't that was was quite uh, supportive for bhikkhunis. After that, we see that there was a very strong change uh, very quickly after the Buddha's passing. So in the story of the first council that we've seen, which probably was written down roughly a hundred years after the Buddha at the, during the second council, um, we see a dramatic change uh, in the attitude towards women. And also in the Vinaya literature that seems to have developed um, after, in, in let's say a few centuries after the Buddha's time, uh, we see very critical attitudes towards women somewhat emerging there. Um, it's not that easy to date the Apadana literature, and the Apadana literature evolved over many, many centuries. Um, but it seems that with the emergence of Mahayana, um, Mahayana was a counter movement to that movement that happened uh, after the Buddha's passing. So after the Buddha's pass passing, the Sangha became not only more um, more misogynistic or more sexist, but the Sangha also became a lot more aesthetic. 
Um, there was a lot more emphasis, emphasis on reclusive practice alone in the forest. So the lone sage in the forest became a role model as opposed to a community practice. Um, and then Mahayana started to so speak as a counter movement with more emphasis on, um, on compassion and on, on connection with the people. And that also then brought um, um, changing attitudes towards women. But Mahayana also developed over many, many, many centuries. So it's not that easy to actually put uh, figures on the Apadana literature, especially because in Yasudala's case, the Apadana seems to be much later than all the rest of the Apadana. Um, but I think also maybe I can ask Vanessa to say a little bit about this, because Vanessa actually, she is an expert on Yasudara. She has written a book on Yasudara, so I'm actually not at all confident to speak in front of her about, about Yasudara. So uh, I think maybe you can say a few words, Vanessa, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Are you I think you did such a beautiful job. It was so nice to read the Apadana with you like that. I have, I have no critiques whatsoever. And I think um, you raised some really good points. I didn't know about that Analayo article, so I wrote that down. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, in terms of, you're, you're asking a question about, um, Anne-Marie, about like when it switched over or when things got more patriarchal, is that what you're wondering? Yeah, like how, how easy, if it, if it is at all possible to date these texts and to see at what times it was a bit more like this and what times it was a bit more like that. It's really hard. There's, um, there's also the scholarship has slowed down on that front. So it was a very popular thing to kind of wrestle with um, early on in the 19th century. Then it, you know, there was a wave of it again in the 80s and 90s. So the scholarship goes through waves where it really wants to tackle those kinds of questions and then it stops and other things become interesting and we're not. So right now we're not really getting a lot of new scholarship helping us date a lot of this material. We're not seeing many new translations. So the Walters translation of the Apadana is a new translation, but there are very few of them being done right now. So we don't have really new discussion. What we have is roundabout dates Everything is kind of, well, <laughs> you know, we're dating. So we're looking at some of our earliest literature might be about maybe, it depends when you date the Buddha also. And we don't agree as to when he lived. And then once we agree as to when he lived, if he lived, which that's also a debate, then when were the first texts? And then which ones were the first texts? And we're looking at maybe 400 years after he lived that we start seeing the first text go into writing, but then we don't even have manuscripts in some cases for 1800 years after that, right? Some of our earliest manuscripts other than like our Kuroshti fragments and our Gandharan fragments are from the 18th century and the 19th century because a lot of the manuscripts that were written, they were written on very brittle materials that didn't last, right? They weren't writing on leather the way biblical manuscripts were. So we don't have really old manuscripts except for little bits and pieces. So everything's kind of guesswork and kind of scratching your head going, well, this might, you know, but the broken telephone situation is really intense. Um, so if the Buddha lived, let's say 500 BC, and then let's say the first fragments of writing happens 300 or 400 years after that, then our first manuscripts are 2000 years later. It's crazy. The um, space we have between what he might have said if he existed and what we have written, right? So that's where oral tradition becomes really important, but then oral tradition can't be tracked in a very serious way. So it's a lot of guesswork. We don't have any confirmations of anything. And when people want to have confirmations, it's a kind of insecurity of saying, no, no, I'm right. And this is how it goes. So what Venerable is doing in this course is really trying to figure out the layers of like, well, did this come before? And she's trying to, she's almost like creating like a Sherlock Holmes of the puzzles of all these texts. And she does it brilliantly, but, and, and, but she, and she's right all, like, I think she's right all the time, but um, we don't, we don't actually know. We're just trying to figure it out, you know? So we hope the Buddha was as inclusive as we're imagining. We hope he existed. We hope he wouldn't have supported things like the Garudharmas and some of the decisions that were made later. We don't know. We don't know anything, you know, and that's that's hard. So that's also something to, I think, keep in mind as we go forward with this stuff is to try to figure out which part is a projection of my hopes and needs of what Buddhism should be 
and who he was, if he existed, you have to like keep this humility and not get to that certainty. That certainty will kill you. You know, it's really kind of bad for your thinking, I think. It's, it's hard. Thank you, Manessa. Thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate your input. And I agree, it's a lot like it's kind of a lot of guesswork and then we can make educated guesses if we read a lot of material and we can also rely on judgment of other people and we can like see developments in the text like which yeah. text must be earlier which text must be later but still we can't really put a number like a, um, a date we can only say this one is earlier than the other one um, but we can't really say anything with um, absolute certainty and those things of seeing who's earlier and who's later you really can do mm -hmm. right some of these texts quote previous texts so we do get a roadmap in the text of how they're building and how they're quoting each other and how they're using each other mm -hmm. but we just don't know where the start point is and we don't know we, ju we just we don't know there's a lot of stuff we don't know so i just it's really important i think i see this a lot in in um, sangha groups is this kind of certainty that comes out it gets very zealous of mm. this is who the Buddha was. This is what he would have wanted. This is how he felt about these things. All of that stuff is really dangerous terrain, you know? So I, I just think we have to stay humble all the time. I don't know. I want to believe the Buddha was not a misogynist. I desperately would like to believe that if he had insight, he would not have seen all women as being some kind of polluted, destructive force. I really need to believe that, but I don't know. I don't know what he would have said. It's hard. Tracy, did you just raise your hand or were you just waving? Okay, please go ahead. Waving and racing, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, thanks Vanessa. Um, and thank you, um, thank you Aya. I really um, appreciate the session today. Um, I think that it's, it's actually just like really helpful to hear any stories about like kind of civic leadership by women in the like early texts, because I think, um, you know, even though like there's a jumble of like dates and um, sources. I think some stories have been told more often than others, at least like in my experience. And so um, I think that the stories of like women in domestic roles are like extremely powerful and moving. Um, and I think it's also like uh, really healing and helpful to hear about women in leadership roles. So I like, you know, I just love hearing, you know, having that centered and, um, and retold and, Look forward to hearing more of those types of stories. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for this session. Okay, I'm glad you appreciate it. I also liked this session. Actually, I didn't expect to like the session so much. Of course, I used to have a very difficult relationship with Yashodara. I somehow couldn't emotionally really connect with her. But uh, when I prepared for this session, somehow I felt it was a lot more inspiring than I had expected it to be. So yeah. I actually also think this is one, probably one of my more favorite uh, sessions. Can I ask you a question, Venerable? Yeah, sure. Why did you, why do you have a difficulty with your children? What's the obstacle? Uh, well, first of all, she doesn't appear in the early sources. So for me, there's a question mark there. Did she really exist? Is this just uh, like a, a figment of, you know, like, is, is this just a delusion that we are all following? And um, uh, I'm kind of a truth seeker. So I'm in Buddhism because I really want to understand the truth about reality and the truth about, you know, my own mind. So, you know, connecting very strongly with a story that is delusional, uh, seemed like there was just a barrier in my heart to somehow connect with her. But even if the story is not true in the historical sense, it's a story about a powerful woman. And I mean, the storytelling has, I mean, probably the stories weren't made to be historically truthful. They were made to be inspiring. And they were made to tell stories that um, maybe could have been or that people thought that were possible. So at some point I came to realize that maybe it's not all that necessary for the story to be historically truthful uh, to still have a valuable contribution. So then I gave up my in internal resistance a little bit. But what about, so if you're going to argue history, 
I mean, I don't know about the history of any of this, to be honest. Um, but if we're arguing historical value, she's all over the Jatakas. And those, some of those are extremely early. And then you have her in Buddha Gosha's, um, the Buddha Charita, Ashvagosha, sorry. <laughs> Ashvagosha's Buddha Charita. And that's first or second century. So that competes with some of the earliest suttas we have. So even if she's not in the Pali sources, she's in the Pali Jatakas and she's in the Buddha Charita. And that's very, very early. So I don't know if your if your historical skepticism deserves, you know, like if she deserves to be that, like, like if you're going to be skeptical about her, then you have to be skeptical about everything else too. Because if she's in the Jatakas and she's in Ashvagosha, she's almost as, she's equivalent to the other characters, no? I don't know why you would question her and not question, you know, Maya dying or whatever it is. I mean, it's, I mean, I know we have the Acharya Buddha Sutta, which is very early, but, but so is Ashvagosha. He's very early. No? So I also question Maya dying. So I also have a question mark uh, okay, around true. Maya. <laughs> So um, yeah, I think again this 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 comes to uh, what you just mentioned. There is so much debate about what is early and what is not early, and I guess some of my teachers just uh, don't really consider the Jatakas early. Like the Jatakas are Indian folk tales, and they many of them predate the Buddha. Yeah. But then the connection between the story itself and how they are linked to the rebirths of people seem to have like these seem to have often been added later so the story was there but the connection to to actual like buddhist uh, personalities seems to have been added later in many cases but what um, about visantara there's like visantara reliefs everywhere right don't we have that in barfoot and sanchi mm. yeah but again these, these are centuries after the buddha whereas people many people have faith in the that the the Nikaya texts actually go back to the Buddha to the fifth century. So that makes them a few centuries earlier. But based on what? How would we decide that the Majjhima Nikaya goes all the way back to the Buddha? That's your broken telephone argument. Well, based on text, textual, like internal consistency, I think. So it seems that those texts must have been earlier than some of the other texts because the other texts sort of rely on the earlier texts existing. Um, hmm. But as, I mean, as, as you mentioned, you know, it's difficult. We have, like we have, in that case, we have to have faith in the oral tradition. Right. Um, and that, that for us modern people, that's very hard to have because we have so scattered memories. Uh, our memories are so scattered that we can't even like remember five minutes after what we just heard. Uh, so it's inconceivable for us how these large amounts of text could have preserved over many centuries. Um, and I think other scholars, for example, Analio, have made these arguments how Indian traditions had all these techniques um, that show yeah. us um, how, you, how they could actually preserve this and how uh, also the um, Brahm Brahminical tradition has preserved the Vedas for, for centuries before the Buddha already. Um, and they have like um, the, the the early texts. They have all these um, um, these rhetorical features that make mem memorization much easier. Like all the repetitions, all the synonyms, and um, also the uh, the the stock passages that are, that occur in many of the suttas. And these are all features of an oral tradition. So these are texts that must have uh, originated in an oral culture. Whereas many of the sort of little bit later texts don't have those features. So they would have to have originated in a uh, culture that started to use writing more. So the, all these um, features that enable memorization wouldn't have been so necessary. And so when, when texts don't have many repetitions, yeah. then that shows us that this must have come into existence at a time when writing was popular. Whereas if the texts have a lot of repetitions, that seems to indicate that this must have been from a time when people either memorize the text or when they had just switched to writing. So they were still using the earlier tradition because that is what they were used to. Uh, but with the new medium, they didn't actually need to. And then slowly they, they sort of left that out. 
Um, I can see that argument. I'll make you one counter argument because I'm so attached to Yashodara. <laughs> I want to defend her. Um, okay, so my only counter argument to that is that it's, I agree that the memorization techniques are there and that most ancient cultures were able to memorize things in ways that we cannot imagine because we're so reliant on writing things down. So we don't know how to use our memories the way probably ancient communities did. Mm. I will grant you an unalay of that. But my guess is that remembering philosophical texts, it's much easier to make mistakes and find points of philosophical arguments and what people can remember and enjoy and extrapolate and develop and change is stories. I think the one thing that we can guarantee probably was told and retold and retold and changed and changed and changed is the stories. And so even if Yashodra wasn't written by some of the early council members or whatever else, because why would they want to remember her? Because she's a wife and nobody wants her. Um, that story makes, like people would have told the story of the Buddha and the wife and the son and the drama. People love stories. Philosophy, you know, the, the fine points of how your mind gets attached and doesn't get attached and the eye seeing and then, you know, getting attached to the object and then the, like this is, this is crazy stuff to have to remember. But you'll remember a good story. Sure, but I think the early people must have thought that the Buddha's teaching was probably more important than, um, you know, his family background, because the teaching is what, you know, brings you to liberation, not the story about Yasudara. In, in but how many people would have been able to do that? I, th I think there was a really big effort in the early, early Sangha to actually memorize that and to preserve that. And that's, that's why communal recitation is so important because right. if, you, if one person recites, it's very easy to make mistakes. But if you recite in a group and one person makes a mistake, that's immediately obvious. Um, that's so, uh, yeah, so, but it's very well possible that, I mean, Yashodara's story was there, but it wasn't uh, fixed in the same way that the, the suttas were fixed. Like the suttas, they were trying to really keep this like verb verbatim, uh, like every single word in the same way yeah. so that they could recite in like in a group. But the, the storytelling tradition, this is like one person telling a story and um, you don't have to memorize that to the no. same extent. And I think that it developed over the centuries and we can, I mean, we can see how it developed. Yeah. Um, we have so many stories, you know, from, from different like, points in time and we see how the story evolved over time. Even last time when we talked about the Seven Sisters, uh, we, we saw how the story sort of got expanded and they added prequels and they added sequels and yeah. even the, the core story about the Seven Sisters who then became aesthetics uh, changed over time and got expanded over time. So I, I think there was a really clear distinction between those um, doctrinal texts that they really yeah. tried to preserve like perfectly and uh, the stories that they were sort of, um, yeah, more flexible with. No, that I think, I think for sure. I think that would be, I don't think there's any need for the stories to be fixed. And I think we have so much evidence that people allowed themselves to play with the stories mm -hmm. and to tell it in their own way. And that's why all these characters keep evolving. And I think that's really important to the tradition mm -hmm. is that the stories keep changing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. But I think the stories probably were always there. I don't know. I wonder if there's a discomfort with the idea of the Buddha having a family, having well, a wife and a child. And so that's sure. why that story keeps getting put to the side. And his mother, it's very much like Christianity. The mother takes front and center and anyone who's intimate with him is, goes in the background. So that's why I think I'm defending these characters. I'm like, no, no, I think we're just putting them away because we don't want them there. For sure. I mean, the story is kind of very controversial because right. the Buddha also abandoned the, the wife and the child. Yes. So that seems like a very cruel thing to do. And uh, we don't want somebody, to do that. Yeah, right? for somebody who is so compassionate or supposed, right. supposed to be so compassionate. That's um, what I think is the problem. For Tracy. sure. Uh, the, other, mm -hmm. the other thing is, uh, the only thing is that I think there is a really large multivocality around, around like the, the Buddha's the Buddha's um, wife, and she has so many names and there's so many stories. So I, I really think that uh, in the beginning, the, the character wasn't that well-defined and the story sort of started to coalesce at some point at a later time. 
Um, but they all agree he left her, right? Sure, yeah. And he left her mm. as she gives birth. Mm. That story keeps coming back. So you, you can't get away from the thorn in the story, right? Like, like we have a problematic Buddha here. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, so yeah, all I'm saying is we don't know. Yeah, no, we yeah. don't. Tracy keeps trying to jump in as we debate. Yeah, it. Tracy. Be, I feel like we could debate this for two hours. I know we're going over time. I just want to say, I just wanted to like raise the question of like, certainly it's problematic for the Buddha to have, um, have left a wife and a child. Um, I think it's also problematic, like for there have for the Buddhist, like for the original Buddhist community to be one where like women and women monastics and women lay women had as much um, of a voice and agency in the Sangha as, as male leaders and the Buddha. So I think that like, so for me, like hearing the types of stories that we had today about like women speaking up in assembly and being like, um, and that not being odd at all, um, mm. I think are really, you know, my question is like, which, you know, which stories is the tradition more uncomfortable with and which ones, you know, which ones need to be retold at this moment in time? So that's sort of like the question I find interesting oh, good. now. Tracy, there's an amazing, sorry, I just have to, okay, and I have to go have a dentist appointment, but um, there's this amazing passage. There's another Sanskrit text called the Lalita Vistara. It's not part of the Theravadan tradition. Um, it's an amazing text. We only have parts of it in Sanskrit. It was translated into Tibetan and we have a more full expansion of the text in the Tibetan version. And th those have been translated into English and you can find them online. Um, there is a passage in the Lalita Vista after they get married. See, I'm such a defender of Yashoda. <laughs> but it's also, I'm projecting that I'm married and I have an only son. So I'm just projecting all of this on the story. I'll just put that out there. Um, but where the the Buddha's parents, the prince, right? So it's Suddhodana and Gotami. They, uh, they ask her, you have to veil yourself. You can't go as the wife of the, of the prince. You have to wear a veil. And women in, the, in this story, in this context, don't, don't show their faces. And she refuses. And she gives a teaching to the entire court in front of her husband, to his parents and the court of why she should show who she is. It is one of the most extraordinary passages of a woman's agency and a voice where she makes the teaching. She challenges the court, the royal family and her husband of why she should show her face and never hide herself. And in the end, they agree. It's an amazing little story. And so if you're looking for those kinds of moments, that's a good one. I act, yeah, that's that's beautiful. Thank you for thank you for saying that. I actually I also love just hearing where it's like normal for women to speak up in assembly, and like that's what I thought was really interesting about the yeah. um, the the passage here. So it's like it's not like a special thing that like a woman no. speaks up. It's actually just like part of the normal discourse, and I think that's really interesting if there is evidence of that. <laughs> thank you. Anyway, this is so interesting. Thank you, Aya. Thank you so much for making this space for us to have this conversation. Yeah, I have to say, I really enjoyed the conversation today. So I'm very, <laughs> I'm very happy that uh, we had the session today. Um, yeah, we have gone a little bit over time and Vanessa has to go to her dentist appointment. So I think, <laughs> I think we're going to wrap up now. Uh, as usual, we will finish with uh, three sadhus. Please join me if you'd like. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.